Welcome back. My name is Joel Thiel. My name is Ian McMillan. And today we are here with Brent Pinkle. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate this. This is, this is fun. Yeah. I'm, we're very excited to get into this interview. We have a lot of great stuff to cover. Uh, Ian, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I guess uh, first order of business is uh, who are you? Well, I am Brent Pinkle. <laughs> uh, I am lecturer of rhetoric here at New St. Andrews. And uh, this is my first year as, as lecturer of rhetoric. Last year, I uh, was a reader in history here. Um, but uh, before coming here, I was all sorts of titles at a college in China uh, where I taught for, and I'm in still still working there from this from the states. But I taught taught there for a number of years, and uh, hmm. yeah, that's that's who I am. <laughs> and what uh, what initially got you interested in in rhetoric? Uh, so uh, I was from a young age. I was always interested in arguing. Uh, I would say things to my parents like, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not arguing, I'm debating, you know, I'm not talking back. I, we're just, we're just debating here. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was always interested in, in arguing and in, in words. Um, but I, I was a public school kid, so I, uh, I didn't grow up with a classical education. And so my, my love of language and of of, of persuasion was just came out in some more organic ways that weren't especially cultivated in, in school uh, mm -hmm. very well. Um, uh, but uh, what really got me interested uh, were, were, were my, my abilities kind of blossomed and my interests grew uh, was actually when I went to college. Uh, so I, I went to Kansas State University and uh, it was there where I uh, really uh, began following Jesus um, seriously. And uh, the first, um, I mean, I, I shouldn't say the first preacher, I, was, I went to a, a local church there, but mm. I very quickly was introduced to John Piper. And uh, I was so caught up in, uh, in well, Piper has such a way with words. He, I think he's, I mean, even now having, having reflected on his preaching and, and seen many more preachers, I would say he's the best um, preacher uh, in, in our generation, at least Western preacher that we know of. Of course, I'm sure there's great preachers that are, don't get the publicity that he does. Um, but he's just, a, he's a phenomenal preacher uh, in terms of his ability to, expound the word clearly and compellingly and uh, and of course if you know anything if you if you've read much of him i mean he's he's written an entire book on uh the power of of words and and language and he's a he he's, he writes poetry and and so he would uh, listening to his preaching i would listen to a sermon of his probably every day for at least i mean my first at least my like my first year of following Christ, mm. um, and that I mean, besides just him make me fall in love with with Christ, I f fell in love with words to a degree that I hadn't I hadn't really before, um, and uh, and so that was that was the the beginning of things. But again, uh, I was public public school. We didn't have anything like a, like rhetoric, and uh, and so. And we can get we can come back to this later of how I ended up in China, but went to China for <laughs> for a while, and uh, eventually ended up at, at New St Andrews. And my uh, my first exposure to classical rhetoric was uh, during grad school here at New St Andrews, and I took a uh, you guys have already interviewed Dr Schlecht, mm -hmm. so Dr Schlecht had a couple electives while I was here, one. Uh, was just a, a classical rhetoric elective, and another was judicial. Well, what do you call it? Um, forensic oratory, I think, was the name of the class. It was um, basically mock trial, hmm. and that's where I was exposed to uh, classical rhetoric, Quintilian, you know, Aristotle, Cicero, and uh, and and all of these things I intuited and felt. Uh, uh, were f suddenly, you know, expounded and very powerful and, mm. uh, uh, you know, articulate ways 
um, that made sense to me. And, and so that was the beginning. That was really the, uh, I have to credit Dr. Schlecht with mm -hmm. getting me really interested in classical rhetoric. Of course, nice. he's, a, he's a rhetoric yeah. guy. He was mock, you know, mock trial coach at, at Logos School here for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, so then uh, went back to China and um, started teaching, teaching rhetoric there and uh, things just grew. So um, that's a, that's a little bit about how things got started. Yeah. We can flesh that out a little bit more here, but yeah. 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 I, uh, I'm actually really interested. There's a lot there, but I think I want to go first to kind of your just Christian testimony and how, uh, you came to know Christ. Uh, yeah. Could you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah. So yeah. I grew up in a, in a Catholic home, okay. uh, and, uh, you know, very loving parents. And we would go to, uh, go to church every, every week I was confirmed. I, uh, you know, I was, I was more or less a faithful Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, but my understanding of the gospel was very works-based, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do good. And if you do enough good, you go to heaven. Um, and I didn't know, you, know, you asked me what the gospel is, you know, or, or, you know, why did Jesus die? I didn't really know. I knew he died and you're supposed to believe that he died on a cross. Um, and so I, uh, that was that was the case uh, all throughout my childhood, through high school, and then I went mm. to college and got involved in a campus ministry in Navigators, and uh, um, I started reading the Bible for myself mm. and joined a Bible study, and my world was turned upside down. I encountered Christ uh, in the Scriptures, and and of course I had some, some really great men in my life. Um, pastors in my life who were uh, teaching the scriptures and living it out and uh, walking me through uh, my questions, but I was um, just captivated by mm -hmm. the glory of Christ. And this, I mentioned John Piper earlier, mm -hmm. and man, I mean, you really have to have a, a heart of stone to not be moved by by mm -hmm. Piper. Just, I, I couldn't stop thinking about the glory of God, mm -hmm. and and seeing that you know everywhere I looked. Um, and uh, and so so that was the be that was the beginning, um, and then things things escalated, if you will, hmm. when I uh, I started attending. So my church hosted uh, a class called Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. And this is a class that uh, I, I think the I think it's still around. I'm not I'm not sure, but uh, host uh, different churches around the the country can host this class, and each week. They invite a it's, a, it's a missions class basically, okay. and they uh, invite a missionary from the field to, they, so the missionaries will come off the field for, for a, a little bit of time and travel around and to these different classes and give, hmm. give talks. And, um, and I, I uh, was just enamored with these missionary stories of, uh, you know, life on the field in these hard places. And I was, that we had, I mean, there was people, you know, in remote tribes of Papua New Guinea, you know, telling all these stories about casting out demons from, it was just, <laughs> I mean, I was so uh, just captivated by these stories yeah. and for, you know, missionaries from the Middle East. And I mean, I remember one guy, um, you know, the, uh, he was told this story about a Muslim who converted and the local community, uh, the question was that the, the this this young man asked the missionary, um, "Can you baptize me?" And then the question was, "Should it be a public baptism or a private baptism?" <laughs> and <laughs> the uh, the the missionary said, "Well, what, what would you like?" And he said, "I think Christ is calling me to for public baptism, but my family and I don't know the community. The the, the buzz is if I do this, I'm going to get killed. Which means if you if you do it." if you baptize me, you're going to get killed as well. <laughs> and so the missionary is just talking about what went through his mind. Like, okay, are we going to do this or not? And yeah. I mean, these are the kinds of guys, the kinds of stories I was coming hearing week after week. Mm. And, um, but then there was a, a China guy, a China guy who came and told some really exciting uh, stories. And, and I was, so I was, um, you know, early on, this was my sophomore year in college when, when I went to the first year of this and every year after I'd go back and listen to more missionaries. But, um, uh, the, uh, where was he going? So, um, the, 
uh, forgot forgot where I was going to go with this. But the the Chinese mm-hmm. the China the China missions guy um, uh, really got me interested in serving in China. But I also wanted to mm-hmm. serve Muslims. The the, the Muslim mm-hmm. guy got me interested in in Muslims, mm-hmm. and uh, and I had some Chinese friends. I was I was studying Chinese for uh, on the side for my my degree. Um, just because I thought it was interesting and different, so I started yeah. making Chinese friends through that, and um, and eventually I uh, learned again through this class that okay, so China is not all the same. Like Chinese people aren't all the same. <laughs> Can you believe it? And then, in a giant country like that, not Chinese people aren't all the same. There's actually minority groups that. Um, you know, we, you've heard you've heard stories of of you know uh, the culture during the Cultural Revolution and yeah. and this explosion of this sort of revival of Christianity mm-hmm. and and so there's this impression that oh yeah there's just Christians and churches everywhere, but that's that's largely true for 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 the Han Chinese, which are the most common mm-hmm. people group in China. But there's all these other minority groups, and there are some Muslim minority groups, um, and uh, and that's when I learned about these Muslim minority groups. Then I uh, became just really interested um, and I had a burden to bring the gospel to them because mm-hmm. they didn't have churches. They, for all intents and purposes, were, were unreached. And mm-hmm. um, and so so that was, I mean, I had, yeah, I had been a, a, you know, a, a Christian, a practicing Christian for, you know, a, a year. And then I'm already starting to think, I, I these people don't know this Christ mm-hmm. and that's wrong and he deserves the glory. He deserves yeah. to be praised and we got to do something about this. And so early on, I had this, this desire to want to uh, bring the gospel to mm. China. And so, uh, and so that was, that was uh, what initially brought me to China. And what was your, what was your experience like moving to that, that culture? Like what were some of the challenges that you encountered? Um, yeah. Well, so um Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, what were the what were some of the what were the challenges you encountered? So, the challenges were different. So, I studied I studied first in Northeast China. Um, so, Muslims are in the west in Western China. I first went to Northeast China uh, to learn Chinese, Mandarin, uh, and that that was a little bit it was a little bit easier. Um, the Han Chinese are just easier they're they're a little bit more like me but mm-hmm. i mean china's chinese culture is still very very different from from western culture hmm. um so that was that was a a little bit easier when when you move west to western china and you start living in this sort of muslim hmm. this this muslim culture uh things get a little bit um, more difficult i think the first the challenge for any anybody that's wanting to do mission work is learning the language yeah and uh, I had studied three years of Chinese at public university in in Kansas, and when I went to China, like I couldn't have a conversation <laughs> with a Chinese person. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically, the like, ling- the the um, the approach of the my Chinese class was <laughs> like, let's just have a good time, guys. <laughs> Okay. And uh, and not like NSA. NSA like actually cares that you learn the languages that yeah. you study and you, you're able to speak them. Yeah. That wasn't really the case for us. It was let's play some fun Chinese games, make some Chinese friends, and uh, <laughs> and we'll just have a good time. Nobody was really serious about studying it. And if you go to mm. China, uh, so when I went to China, I, I studied full time Chinese for two years, and there were most of the foreigners there were there to have a good time. Okay, uh, and so. Uh, and of course, you've got Chinese students who want to befriend you to learn English, and so there's all this pressure just to speak English all the time. And so I had to set some boundaries for myself. Hmm. I would not befriend Chinese people who wanted to learn English; <laughs> just avo- <laughs> politely avoid them. Uh, and I would avoid hanging around foreigners, so that I would I would mm-hmm. be forced to speak Chinese. Um, and that was actually, on the whole, that was a, I think that was a a good decision. I made a lot of progress um, very quickly. God blessed it. I started leading, especially as I, you know, I started leading Bible studies in Chinese. And when you have a, a motivation to learn a language, uh, you make a lot more progress than when you just 
study for its own yeah. sake. So um, that was the f- that was the first big challenge was just language. Did you have? A- yeah, yeah. Well, was that particularly when it came to evangelism? Was there any uh, mm-hmm. you know other than language um, kind of cultural barriers and just conveying like gospel ideas? Yeah. Um, yeah so we we tend to think of um, of Chinese as Buddhist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, that's a minority of Chinese. Most hmm. Chinese, Han Chinese, are atheists. Hmm. Um, and and so in that regard, I mean, that's more and more so the case here, although I suppose now there's kind of this new age spiritualism that's that's becoming uh, popular. But hmm. um, the 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 challenge uh, that was a that was a big challenge. It's, I mean, the Communist Party is, and public education pushes this whole the whole atheist. Mm-hmm. I mean, very strongly the um, just emphasize atheism's the way, and everything else mm-hmm. is rubbish. Um, and so that was that was first the, just the, you know, overcoming the, the materialism, and atheism, some of those mm-hmm. uh, those hurdles, which I had a, encountered that a lot with my American friends back home. Yeah, so yeah. so that wasn't. Uh, that wasn't too hard, and it was. I would say with Han Chinese, I actually, um, it 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 wasn't sharing the gospel with them wasn't too much different from sharing the gospel with with Americans. I think mm. um, China is a is an honor ba- is an honor shame culture, mm-hmm. um, and so that changes the dynamics of things. And so you know, uh, it's common here in the U.S. some evangelism methods will fo- will. will do the kind of the law, like, uh, you know, your guilt, the, the law metaphors, you're, yeah, you're guilty yeah. under the law. You've, here's the God's law. You've broken the law and, uh, you know, Jesus fulfilled the law and, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you've, the judge has deemed you, you know, uh, innocent or, you know, uh, yeah. the punishment was taken for you. Like these, these mm-hmm. metaphors, and of course they're, they're biblical, the, yeah. um, but, uh, I think they they maybe strike the Chinese conscience, uh, conscience not as heavily as uh, some of the more honor shame motifs in the New Testament. The you know the um, the prodigal son, right? That's not a that's not a a law a law based uh, uh, story. It's uh, the, the gospel is presented in an honor shame way. You know, you've got the son who dishonors the father by, you know, taking the inheritance and leaving. He's too ashamed to go home. And then the father, you know, comes out running to yeah. him and welcomes him back. Um, those kinds of, so l- learning how to uh, tell the gospel, share the gospel yeah. with more more of those motives yeah. uh, really, really helped. Um, but, you know, when I, when I moved to Western China to start working with, with Chinese Muslims, that was... Uh, that was quite different and in many ways more difficult. Um, uh, but I, um, I got along really well with Chinese and I, one, one of the reasons I love China so much, the people were just really great to me. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, there's a word in, in Chinese, 热情, uh, just warm feelings <laughs> is, is uh, direct translation, but they uh, just treat you with, you know, uh, warm feelings, and uh, and so I I got along really well with them, and uh, I still have a great fondness for Chinese people. But the Lord's brought me back here for now, anyway. <laughs> we'll see if we'll see what the future holds. Yeah. And while while there, you helped set up a classical Christian school there. Uh, how long was that after you moved over that you started started? Working yeah. On so that? I didn't actually go over there f- um, uh, with the goal of of doing that. I went over there first with the goal of church planning among these hmm. Chinese Muslims. Like that was the that was the goal. And was that with any particular denomination, or was that kind of through uh, a missions it, organization? Uh, I worked with some. Um, it wasn't denomination; it was more like parachurch organizations. Gotcha. But I, I I worked with a few different parachurch organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I should say I was I uh, was Baptist for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I'm Presbyterian now, but. Mm-hmm. At the time I was Baptist, working with mostly Baptists, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I love my Baptist brothers and sisters, and I, I think they have the best preachers. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I will occasionally go to a Baptist church just, just to w- fellowship with my my brethren and, <laughs> and enjoy the preaching. Yeah, yeah. But um, 
So I, I went to China first to, to do church planning. And then as I learned which gifts I had, um, you know, I, I, I discovered I'm more more gifted to teach um, than to than to pastor per se. And so that's when I started shifting to Christian education and dis- mm. discovered classical Christian education. And yeah. so I actually discovered classical Christian ed- education in China through Pastor Wilson's uh, blog. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I, and it was John Piper who introduced me to Pastor Wilson. Pastor Wilson uh, preached at one of their conferences on mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis. Uh, and I noticed Pastor Wilson had a way with words. Mm-hmm. And that really drew me to him. Uh, and then I found his blog. And if you've read his blog, yeah. he has a way with yeah, words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, he introduced me to classical uh, Christian education and just uh, really all the pieces I, I i had felt a lot of a lot of these goals um of classical christian education i i had felt them intuitively mm-hmm. in in various ways but i'd never heard it articulated i didn't know this was a thing and when i discovered this i thought this is what i made for this mm-hmm. is um, um this is it and so i started looking in uh to see if the, is anybody in china doing this i didn't want to leave china i wanted mm-hmm. to keep on uh uh, you know, helping to disciple these believers. Um, and I couldn't find anything except this one Chinese church uh, in, in central China. And uh, so I, I emailed them. I just found this, this article written by a, a, an elder there who said they were wanting to start this, this classical Christian school, mm. uh, this K through 12 school. And, uh, and so I flew down there on my own time just to see what they were doing, to talk with them and discover they were wanting to to start a college Mm -hmm. modeled off of NSA, uh, loosely modeled off of NSA. And, uh, and I thought, I've got to work with you guys. We got to, we got to do that. I would love to, to help Mm -hmm. out. And, uh, and so that was then that I decided I'm going to go to NSA, get get my master's, see how this works. And, um, and then I'll come back and help you guys start this college. Uh, and that's and so that's that's how I got into classical Christian yeah. education. That's how that that college started. Mm. And you still teach online for that for that college? Uh, yes. So I took mm. a I took a a break this first year teaching rhetoric here just so I can focus on um, on uh, the getting the the course sort <laughs> of. The, I, I had to put in a lot of work this year just to put my own spin on the course. And uh, so now that I've got those things laid, I'm, I'm lined up to uh, go back to teaching online. So I, I, I should mention, I, so I came back uh, to the United States at the end of 2018. Uh, I was forcefully uh, kick, mm. kicked out of the country. Uh, and so I, uh, when I came back here, I did keep teaching online full time for them. And then eventually NSA asked me to, to, to work here. But, uh, so I'll be, yeah, starting next year, I'll, I'll be teaching again uh, for them, mm-hmm. but I'll still be, mm-hmm. I'll still be here at NSA as well. Yeah. Could you elaborate on getting kicked out a little bit? Like what, what's the state of kind of just Christianity in China generally? Is it generally frowned upon? What's kind of the attitude towards it there? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the, the communist party, uh, by, by law, they recognize Christianity and, and, and it's legal to be a Christian and to worship as a Christian, but you must worship in state approved churches. Mm-hmm. And you can imagine what that means. Uh, so the, the CCP um, um, forces the, the state approved churches, mm-hmm. you know, the, the preaching must align with the communist values. And if you're not in line, then they, you know, mm-hmm. force you to change or shut you down. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, most Chinese, I would say, Maybe two thirds of of Chinese Christians go to churches that aren't state approved. Hmm. Uh, uh, sometimes these are called house churches because originally, mm-hmm. you know, after the cult- uh, you know during cultural revolution, they were meeting in houses, and hmm. uh, now you know they, these some of these have become you know not meeting in houses. They become so large, um, but the for a while, the, for for many years, the Communist Party tolerated these. They didn't really they weren't legal per se, but uh, they didn't really care as long as you weren't plotting to overthrow the government. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then Xi Jinping came to power and, um, and really, uh, really, uh, you know, 
locked, or I can't think of the word now, but uh, mm-hmm. uh, the passed some new policies that uh, basically forced these house churches. Either you register with the government and become one of these, these three self churches is what they call them, or hmm. we shut you down. And so we, there's, there was this new wave of, um, of persecution where especially they started with the most influential house churches. Hmm. And, and I was um, with one of those. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, they, for many, uh, the whole time I was there every week, two police officers would come to the church hmm. and film, uh, you know, record the sermon, record the audience. Uh, and I was wow. the only foreigner that would go there every week. So the, um, like all of the, all of the, I mean, almost, I think, I think all of the, um, mission organizations that have people working in China, um, um, I would all the ones that I encountered anyway mm-hmm. uh, told uh, required their missionaries to not attend Chinese churches hmm. for the sake of the for the for your own safety and for the sake of the chur- of the church not getting them in trouble hmm. um, and that bothered me. Um, and so I would, I yeah. would work with groups yeah. that were with these organizations, but I wouldn't join the organization so that yeah. I could uh, <laughs> go with these churches because I think it's, I think it's important for the missionaries who are helping these churches mm. to be, a, be a part of their community, to be worshiping with them. Uh, and of course we were starting a school and, and so all my students were going to this church and I, I wanted to worship them and to understand. So I, I, I would go there and I got their blessing and they welcomed me and, mm. and, um, and I'm really glad I did. Um, but of course you go every week with the police video recording you wondering mm. how long <laughs> is this going to last? Yeah. And, uh, and I lasted longer than I expected, but then, <laughs> uh, uh, shortly before they raided the church, eventually they raided the church, mm. closed mm. the whole thing down imprisoned the pastors. And, uh, many of my students were, were, uh, arrested, sent to a Mm. re-education center. And, um, but about a month before they, they did all that, they got rid of me so that presumably so that the, the U S government wouldn't get involved, Mm. (laughs) um, uh, you know, hearing about a, you know, the the imprisoning of missionary in China, that, that that doesn't sound good, uh, in the news. So, um, so they kicked me, they, they basically, uh, one day just came and uh, sent a, a, a group of police officers in a church. Uh, hmm. We had a, we had a, it was an interesting, it was an interesting experience because usually there was these two police officers that would come mm-hmm. and, uh, and I had, we had made this plan with the Chinese, uh, with the, with the pastor that, you know, if the church is being raided while I'm there, I should try to escape if I can. Um, and, they asked me, you know, to sit sit near a door, uh, and so the two police officers come in, and then walk right down the aisle past me, and then a third. Was this and during then, a service? This is during a service, okay. hmm. uh, and then a fourth, and then a fifth, and then a sixth, and then a seventh, and then an, uh, all right, this is <laughs> this is different. Yeah, and uh, and so I here you know, I thought I was being sly. I they when the eighth <laughs> one went and there was there was no more coming and they were still walking to sit down in the back i thought mm-hmm. i'm just going to sneak out here they're not going to they're not going to find me i mean they didn't seem to look at me when they walked you know when they walked by like, and he, and <laughs> i'm <laughs> foolish for thinking i blend like i don't blend in very well but uh, and uh, and so I, I sneak out and then as soon as i sneak out the door i hear them yelling and all eight of them in the middle of the sermon run down the aisle yelling yelling at me and uh <laughs> and so they so anyway long story short they i ended up having to uh yeah go and get interrogated and, mm. and that was hmm. that was a whole in, that was an interesting experience yeah. too what sorts of um, things did they ask what did they ask yeah. well they were really curious about my involvement with the with the with the church mm. and with the with the pastor um what you know what are you doing here and mm. um uh, but they would, we, it was really interesting cause I, uh, I, it dawned on me. I mean, I was, I, I was prepared for this, that this was mm-hmm. 
I, I, I'm a little weird, maybe. I don't think this is weird. I think this is, <laughs> I think most missionaries think yeah. about these kinds of things, but, uh, you know, you look forward to the, you, you read all the like the martyr stories and, <laughs> and I, those, I mean, if you listen to John Piper, come on, yeah. he's, always, he's always like, don't waste your life. Like, you know, give mm-hmm. your life for Christ. Like what an honor to die for Christ and all this stuff. And so I, mm. I was excited. I've always, you know, I, mm. I, I'm still bummed I wasn't imprisoned because I would love, <laughs> I would love the, the prison experience and yeah. the prison testimony, you know, like, <laughs> like what's that? What's, what, uh, oh, it's so great. And, uh, cause it did seem like it was those stories that initially inspired you to, to go. Yeah. In the first place. Yeah. And I mean, like, again, mm-hmm. like I had all these missionary stories that I'd, I'd heard all the time and, um, and so what an honor to be like a part of this. So, you, 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 <laughs> yeah. so I finally get to go to a Chinese like police station and interrogation room and, and <laughs> you know, is what's coming after that. You know, am I going to go to, to jail? Mm. Um, and so I, yeah, I walk into the interrogation room and there's, there's, it, it was this concrete, this small little concrete room, a little bit larger than this, this little room we have here, mm. uh, just all concrete. And then the middle is a metal chair. It looks like a, an electric chair, just. Uh, bolted to the ground oh, and it's got <laughs> these shackles and this thing that goes over your uh, your your waist kind of like a, a, a like a baby's high chair like it's got this hmm. thing that goes over your waist and then shackles you in yeah <laughs> wow and uh, <laughs> and again like I had no idea how this was gonna go because you hear you know I've heard a lot of stories about people being tortured and stuff and so I, so I, the first thing I asked when I walk in there I was like are you gonna sh- I sit down are you gonna shackle me <laughs> <laughs> And because uh, I wanted the shackled experience, and they said no, and and so I was like a little bit. Well, I didn't ask them, "Can you shackle, can you shackle me just just for kicks?" But um, and uh, the police were really nice. Uh, I mean, we're really nice. They, were, I mean, as nice as they could be, I guess. But we had we had some interesting. Besides, you know, me, me answering the questions, I I started asking them questions because I was really curious what it's like to be a Chinese police officer. You know, what do you think of America? Uh, uh, and they had some interesting thoughts uh, about that. One of them said uh, he had just come back from visiting California, uh, California, uh, and seeing the mm. criminal justice system and seeing the see the the police, what the police are like there. And he said, you know, man, uh, it's so dangerous in America. There's people with guns all over the place, all these shootings all the time. China's safe. Like we don't have this problem. He was kind of boasting about how great their police were, hmm. and I said, and I and I and I told him, you know, you know what's you know what's safer than China, North Korea, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so anyway, we had this nice this fun exchange. But um, what things really got heated up though uh, after the they interrogated me, the the um, the religious affairs bureau people came, wow. and uh, and they were like out of a movie. There was like a one one of the guys, an older guy, was like two faced from like Batman. Like he had some like birthmark, and it was like, wow. and uh, and they were they were intense and yelled at you know it would yell at me like in the movies and all yeah. of that. Uh, and uh, but we had great like I again I like I realized I could ask them questions too because I I am really <laughs> curious like yeah what's what makes you tick and why are you doing this and why are, like why are you so worked up about Christians worshiping Jesus and so. Uh, started asking them, uh, you know, are you a Christian? And one of the one of the guys uh, said, you know, his mo- his parents were Christians, oh. and uh, and that was interesting. And so mm-hmm. I got to uh, have a conversation. Well, why don't you believe? Are you an atheist? I mean, uh, he was he was an atheist. Why don't yeah. you believe in God? And uh, and so I got to share the gospel, you know, with them. And um, and so it was a hmm. it was a really interesting experience. Yeah. And um, but at the end of the day, you know, they they kicked me out, and uh, mm-hmm. we'll see if and I I don't know if I'll get a chance to go back. I hope I yeah. I hope I do. But the Lord opened up a door here for me at NSA, and mm-hmm. uh, and I'm happy to I'm happy to teach students here. Uh, have some really great students. Yeah, but, and going back to like your uh, teaching in college there, um, and your discovery of uh, the classical orators like Quintilian and, and Cicero. Um, how did that <clears throat> kind of change your view of, of rhetoric? Um, like, cause like at call at initial, like your, you know, undergraduate college, right. um, mm-hmm. if it was your first experience, uh, at NSA, then it was probably a different looking rhetoric curriculum. Right. That's a great, uh, that's a great question. I, mm-hmm. uh, so 
rhetoric, well, I should, I should mention too, while I was at NSA in grad school, I did a, a, a project where I interviewed, well, I, I reviewed all of the main um, modern rhetoric textbooks on the market. Hmm. And then I uh, interviewed um, dozens of rhetoric teachers from across the country, uh, high school rhetoric teachers, hmm. um, with the goal of getting a sense of the state of rhetoric education today. And, uh, and so I, I, um, as I started reading then the ancient texts like Quintilian and, and Cicero and Aristotle, I, um, began to discover, um, where we're neglecting the ancients and how we're, Mm. we're missing, we're missing some things. Mm. Um, and, uh, I, I think we have a lot of in the you know the classical movement is still quite young. This what we call the classic. I mean that's even that word classical is the the way we use it is it's it's a recent innovation. Mm-hmm. The ancients didn't <laughs> say we're we're doing classical education here. That's a that's a modern <laughs> thing. But uh, it's still it's still young, and we're still trying to figure out how does this whole thing work because we've we've you know we're, we're trying to recover this tradition that we mm-hmm. didn't preserve well, and so and I think rhetoric. Rhetoric is still has a lot of room to grow and mm-hmm. and recovering this this um, this tradition. And so, one of the things that I uh, one of the convictions I can I had as, as I read, um, you know, Quintilian, for example, is um, that rhetoric is an act. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a simple idea, but uh, we tend to think of rhetoric as a theory. It's just a theory. And if you master the theory, then you've mastered rhetoric. And, uh, and it's often taught this way. Um, and so, you know, you, you teach the students, you know, some rhetorical figures. Here's the figures. And can you identify them? And uh, ethos, pathos, logos, what are they? And then, you know, you give, a, you, you give the, you know, the student a, a, a passage and, okay, where's the ethos? Where's the logos? You know, where's the pathos? And if they correctly identify it, oh, look, well, I'm a master rhetorician now. Hmm. Um, and that's not how the ancients understood rhetoric education. So Quintilian hopefully divides um, art. He's ta- he, he has a section where he, he's talking about um, what is art? What kind, what, what kind of an art is rhetoric? And he says there's three kinds of arts. There are three theoretical arts. There are practical uh, Pra- uh, a poetic arts and practical arts and theoretical arts. Uh, the goal of a theoretical art is to obtain knowledge. So we, we study it to get the information in your head. And that's, that's the goal. So like philosophy or something, you understand, understand the thing. Understanding is the goal. Poetic uh, arts, the goal is to create an artifact, a, a physical artifact. So, you know, a sculpture, uh, a poem, um, uh, a, a a building um, that's a that's a poetic art, and a practical art. The goal is uh, an action, so it's it's to produce an action, like uh, like martial arts or something like that. Hmm. And m- many, if not most, today um, think of rhetoric and teach rhetoric either as a theoretical art or as a poetic art, hmm. and. Quintilian says, although rhetoric has aspects of both of those, it's a primarily a practical art. Hmm. It's an act because the goal of rhetoric is to produce an act that is a speech. And, um, and, and this dramatically affects how you teach, how you teach it. So uh, um, it's rhetoric should not be taught like a philosophy class where we are, we're examining the theory and we're trying to memorize the theory of rhetoric. I mean, there is a theory to rhetoric. There, um, there, there are principles, but the goal isn't just memorize the principles and and voila, you've mastered rhetoric. Um, the goal is to be able to speak persuasively, mm. and that's two very different things. To to uh, know how to speak and to be able to speak are are two very different things. And uh, and so I, my, my conviction and what I strive to do here at NSA is to teach rhetoric as an act, um, 
as a, I, I, the ancients frequently use martial language mm-hmm. uh, or um, athletics, uh, athletic analogies to describe how to practice um, rhetoric. And so rhetoric is, is uh, I, the way I approach it, um, it's a training regimen. And the, the main way that we cultivate, um, we cultivate this skill is through practice. It's through doing doing the acts, doing the exercises. And, and so the, the, um, you know, the, the ancients would begin with the progymnosmata, uh, with pre- preliminary exercises. You can hear gymnastics, gymnosmata. So it's, again, very athletic kind of language. Uh, and so these are a series, of, a series of exercises that begin, they begin easy, they get, they get harder as you go, and they introduce you to... Um, different skills they isolate different skills and you practice them individually i can i can tell my students uh you know it's it, if you want to learn suppose you want to learn how to box you never boxed before and you go up you show up at the gym and you got the, the coach there and you say all right i want to i want to learn how to box a good coach is not just going to throw you into the mm-hmm. the ring mm-hmm. and say all right here's a here's somebody just go go fight them um you start with some push-ups Right, and then mm-hmm. you do the, hit the punching bag, and you, you each of these little exercises isolates and hones a specific skill. And then once you've conditioned yourself, and uh, once you've practiced all of these different you know moves and 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 skills, then you put them all together in a complete training exercises, which which the ancients uh, called declamation. And so eventually we graduate to declamation, and that's that's the real. Uh, that's the real battleground, if you will, in which we we cultivate these skills. But I um, I, I I like to tell my students that I use a an analogy of a the Cheeto Man. We we have this the, this uh, uh, the metaphorical Cheeto Man and the Cheeto Man. Here, here's the Cheeto Man. The Cheeto Man, uh, overweight guy, you know, a, a, a white T-shirt that's a little too small for him, sitting in his <laughs> recliner. Uh, uh, eating his Cheetos and he loves watching MMA. Every night he sits back in his recliner, eats his Cheetos and watches MMA and analyzes every little thing that the the fighters do. And he's yelling at the TV, no, 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 you should have, you know, moved this way, moved that way. And uh, if you, uh, and then he, the, the joke, if you will, is, you know, he, uh, some, he meets some guy and, uh, Tells the guy, hey, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a martial artist, and he says, "Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you're a martial artist. Like, well, you know, where? Have, you know, he looks him up and down, you know, with his Cheeto stained <laughs> shirt. Oh, martial artist, really? All right. Uh, when's the last time you fought? Oh, I've never fought. Like, I've never, I've, I've never fought. But I could tell you anything you want to know about martial arts, right? <laughs> I can tell you how to, how to kick. How to, you know, w- when the guy goes this way, you should go that way. I can tell. I can, I can tell you everything." Um, and of course, we the we understand how humorous that is, right? The uh, that doesn't make you a martial artist. The fact that you can <laughs> identify what the guy should have done, mm-hmm. what would make you a martial artist is can you can you get into the ring and take the guy down yourself? Mm-hmm. Like that's that's a martial artist. Mm-hmm. And yet, many times we talk about uh, rhetoric uh, or rhetoricians like the the. The Cheeto Man, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, I can identify ethos, pathos, logos, right? I can tell you what 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 figure of speech this is. Um, that doesn't make you a rhetorician. It doesn't make you an orator. Uh, it's you're you're a fine analyst, if you will. Um, but being able to persuade somebody is a very dif- different and more difficult skill than just being able to identify the theoretical mm-hmm. principles. And so. Quintilian was huge in helping me to to see this mm-hmm. and uh, and and model model this for me and and um, but of course all the all the ancient rhetoricians understood this and they they talk about this and uh, and so that's how I, that's how I approach rhetoric here so it's you know very focused on exercise and practice we still have theory um, and uh, um, also imitation so imitation theory practice is kind of the trifecta that the ancients would, would stress. So give, we study examples of good rhetoric. Mm. Um, but the main emphasis here is, is practice, practice, practice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, 
And as the more students do this, uh, the the more progress they'll see. But it's a it's a it's a slow. You know, nobody learns learns. You know, no, nobody becomes Cicero in a day, and uh, that m- makes some students get frustrated because of that. You know, hey, I've I've been especially you know I've 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 read I've read Cicero. And I'm not any more persuasive. persuasive. Like, what's the deal? It's not working. It's like, that's, yes. And in fact, Cicero begins his whole book by telling you, Mm -hmm. if you don't practice, this is going to be useless to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I, uh, I stress that to the students, um, but they, they slowly discover, yeah, the, the more we do these exercises, I actually do become more persuasive. I actually, I actually am able to invent arguments and more arguments than I otherwise would have been able to, you know, uh, and so it's it's fun to see see them see them grow. But I would love to see rhetoric education and just classical in the classical circles uh, graduate beyond just theory. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Um, it looks like we're uh, we're running a little bit yeah. low on time, but there's one thing that we have to talk about that I've been okay. dying to talk to you about. Okay, going back to China, you were on a you were hosted a Chinese travel show. Yes. So Please what tell was us about yeah? That. What was yeah. your experience? How did you get involved in doing that? Uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah. So I, this was, this was after I had decided to come to NSA, I needed money and I was teaching, I was already teaching at a, at a university there, public university there to, to get money, but I needed more money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I heard from a friend that the, the provincial TV station was wanting to film a travel show with a, a, a foreigner hosting and kind of like an Anthony Bourdain kind of thing. Hmm. You travel around and uh, experience Chinese culture from a foreigner's perspective. So I just called up the guy. I had, I had previously had some uh, experience in Chinese television uh, on a, on a uh, I was a finalist in this Chinese language competition and they flew me to Beijing and I, wow. uh, that's another story. I, <laughs> I ended up on on, on national t- TV, dressed in a cowboy outfit that was about three sizes too small, playing bongo drums. Uh, is it still available? On this the is available <laughs> in the deep recesses of the internet, and hopefully, it stays hidden uh, hidden there. Okay. Uh, but I'd, I'd had some experience in in Chinese television, and and so that helped in, in my favor, and. Mm. So I, so they they hired me to to host the show, and so we would travel travel around different parts of the province, uh, uh, experiencing Chinese culture in all mm-hmm. kinds of different ways. We would, you know, sometimes we, you know we'd have like a food show, we'd try different kinds of foods, or I would go behind the scenes of some China, you know, in, in the in the back kitchen of some, um, you know, uh, noodle restaurant, and they would teach me how to make noodles or. Uh, we would go to a Chinese opera and then I would go and backstage and all the actors would, you know, teach me different things. I'd, <laughs> you know, talk with the director of the orchestra and he would show me how to direct and uh, or go, nice. we have an episode with a famous, you know, sculptor and she would take me to her studio and teach me how to sculpt. But there was this different, uh, different experiences like that. And that was, uh, that was a blast. And it, what was interesting was my Chinese wasn't very good at the time. <laughs> and and so that was part of the fun was like I would make these blunders in front of the camera and then afterwards in the editing they would make fun of me they were like you know on the, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen Asian TV but they have all these like cartoons that pop up oh, on the yeah, screen yeah. and they have these words and they and I'll make fun of how I say things <laughs> and uh, and so that was it, I, I was kind of the butt of the joke like the I, and I knew that I played into that a little bit like yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. like I'm hired to make a fool of myself. <laughs> um, but it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, there were some challenging experiences as a Christian that you, mm. I mean these weren't Christians, mm. and so they you know try and get you to force you to do things, and you would turn it down and make people mad. And um, but yeah, that was the uh, we probably filmed twenty twenty some episodes. Mm. Uh, but I got my money, and it was because of all that I was able to come to NSA, and so very thankful for that experience. And these are also. Publicly available, possibly. Oh, they're on the re- in the, the deep recesses of the internet too. Nobody would mm. know. Your audience doesn't need to watch those. Yeah. Well, 
Awesome. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah, I wish yeah, we had thank you guys. a lot more time. But, yeah. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.